appreciate it. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, um, cool. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, I won't take too long in the preparation, but thank you so much for coming out for a special political education event um, on the recent bank failures, why they're happening, and what socialists can do about them, what kind of policy is adequate to address them, and what who has the power to affect said policy. Um, it's, we know, uh, sometimes seemingly forbiddingly technical uh, thing to talk about uh, what the hell is happening with banks. Um, we hope that the effect of these presentations will be um, to make it simpler. Um, the idea being that the ways of the ruling class are purposely made complex, but are actually not that hard to understand. They're just screwing us over. And uh, um, that we will just clarify a, a little bit in what ways and uh, talk through and then hopefully have an open discussion. And please, you know, nobody should feel like something is too. Uh, well, what I always tell my students is the best questions are usually stupid questions, i.e. the questions that you feel like you're dumb to ask, but actually everyone else has too. So please feel free to ask any questions, um, jump in, any thoughts. Um, no thought is uh, incorrect or unappreciated when we get to discuss them. Hopefully we'll have plenty of time. Um, so I will just briefly introduce our panelists for the uh, afternoon and then kick it off to them. Um, so Emily, um, whose idea of the panel was, um, uh, Emily Eisner has a PhD in economics from UC Berkeley, where she studied macroeconomics and public finance. She currently teaches uh, the economic history of the US at Barnard. Before her PhD, Emily worked in the financial research division of the Federal Reserve um, Bank of New York City and helped produce research on financial regulation and supervision, as well as monetary policy implementation. Emily's also quite deeply involved in our Tax the Rich campaign, um, which is reaching its uh, 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 climax in the present. Uh, so, uh, Doug Henwood, um, for some reason, I have the bios in this order, so I'll go like that. Um, I'm going actually, I think, reverse order of the presentation. So, that's, uh, Doug Henwood is an economic journalist and broadcaster. He wrote about the Silicon Valley, Valley bank failure in the nation, and people might have read his classic book, Wall Street, one of the best uh, Marxist an an uh, analyses of contemporary um, finance. Um, and uh, finally, we have James, uh, I might mispronounce his last name, Ostaszewski. Ostaszewski. Right. Right. We've known each other for years now, and I'm still bad at this. Um, uh, but James is an attorney from New York City who has specialized in complex financial fraud litigation. Over the years, James has worked at top rated national law firms on various cases related to 2008 financial crisis, litigated and won in front of the US Supreme Court twice and represented low-income New Yorkers facing lawsuits by debt collectors. He currently serves as counsel to State Senator Jabari Brisport, and I should mention was um, a key uh, movie player in our first Tax the Rich campaign a couple of years ago. So, um, and Doug, I should say, is deeply involved in North Brooklyn and citywide political education. So we all have expert economists, um, Marxists, and uh, deeply involved DSA activists to talk to us today. So let's give them a round of applause. And I'm Jeremy, co-chair of NYC DSA and political educator. Sorry. Um, without further ado, I'm going to hand it to James to get a kick us off. Uh, uh, okay, so I'm going to cover uh, a bunch of things uh, very quickly, and some things will be a little bit simplified. But the first point I just wanted to make is that what happened last month is we saw three banks fail within about four days. A lot of folks talk about the Silicon Valley Bank and signature bank collapses, but we also sometimes forget about uh, Silvergate Bank, which was the first one to fall. Uh, and uh, for each of these banks, I'm just going to talk very broad in some terms about, one, who were the depositors uh, for these banks, and why were they suddenly rushing to throw their money, uh, and two, on the other side, what assets did these have, uh, banks have, and why was it not sufficient to meet all these withdrawals. Next slide. Uh, first is Silvergate Bank, and which is next one. Uh, this one's actually pretty simple and straightforward. Uh, Silvergate Bank started off as a small community bank, then it became the go to bank of the cryptocurrency world. Uh, those markets, the crypto markets, had a very rough year in 2022, especially with the collapse of FTX and Big Bad Fraud. Uh, and uh, $8.1 billion got withdrawn very rapidly, and the bank fell. That was pretty simple to explain. So next slide, please. Uh, next is Silicon Valley Bank. Next slide. Uh, this is one of the biggest bank failures that we've had uh, in history. 
Uh, Washington Mutual back in 2008 was there, uh, but this one was very fast and very sudden. $42 billion were withdrawn all at once. Slide. Uh, so who were the depositors in Silicon Valley Bank? I think the people here are probably generally know, but it's a lot of Silicon Valley tech startups. Uh, the Daily News described them as cash strapped startups with inflated valuations and concerned revenue streams. And when the Federal Reserve raised uh, interest rates, that caused uh, some troubles for some of these folks who rely on the uh, cheap money. For the next, there was a wave of withdrawals. This story is a little bit more complex than I'm giving credit for it. Next, this is money. Next. Uh, also at uh, SBB, uh, there were some uh, cryptocurrency depositors also. So this is Circle, one of the big crypto uh, entities. They had $2.3 billion in deposits, uh, uninsured deposits. They were ultimately bailed out and made Next. Uh, next is Signature Bank, which is right here in New York City. Um, and you've probably seen the pattern. There's cryptocurrency involvement up to this point. Uh, so the DFS, when Signature Bank was collapsing, the DFS this is Adrian Harris, the head of the financial regulatory agency here in New York. Uh, she said, quote, Signature Bank had a broad deposit base. So this idea that it is a crypto bank is not accurate. That itself is not quite accurate. Next. Uh, if you look at the annual financial reports for our signature bank, they basically told the world, yeah, 20% of our deposits are crypto deposits. Next, uh, TechCrunch put it around 30%. I'm not sure how accurate that is, but uh, the basic point is it was a lot. Uh, but on top of that, signature bank is pretty well known here in New York as also being kind of a landlord bank. So a lot of the deposits that were there are landlords that were doing business with the bank. And a lot of their um, uh, dealings on the other end are also with uh, multifamily uh, developers. And the way that the Wall Street Journal kind of synthesized all this was they explained well, you've got a bunch of landlords who have their money here, they're spooked about cryptocurrency risk, and then they pulled all their money out because of that. So uh, there are three banks that saw massive withdrawals. Uh, that kind of begs the question if these banks have enough assets to cover this. Uh, I'm going to breeze over this and let the uh, economists talk about this in more detail. Uh, but the short version is uh, as interest rates go up, the value of certain securities held by these banks goes down. So interest rates go up, value goes down uh, for a lot of normally safe seeing things like US Treasuries, government bonds. So to take one example, SDB. Uh, when they started to see a bunch of withdrawals, they were forced to sell some of their assets, uh, some of these government securities. And uh, right before they collapsed, they sold 21 billion of those assets at a loss of 1.8 billion. Everyone saw this get reported and panicked even more. Uh, another thing to mention uh, there should be some people out there uh, regulating and overseeing these, these banks and institutions. Make sure that they don't have assets to uh, you know, meet their obligations. But Moody's rated them as investment grade all the way up until the day that regulators shut their doors. Uh, so even when there was this nearly $2 billion loss, they were still rated as investment grade. It wasn't until the collapse that they, uh, Moody's finally moved them down to joint status. Another thing to keep in mind this is not just a problem for these three banks. Uh, this chart up here is from a hearing that was held just a few weeks ago at the U.S. Senate, uh, where the FDIC showed up. And this is uh, showing all of the FDIC insured banks across the spectrum. Uh, and when, as I mentioned before, interest rates go up, the value of their assets go down, they're sitting on more than $600 billion in unrealized uh, paper losses. So if there were uh, a bunch of withdrawals, they would have a tough time uh, meeting those obligations. I mean, it's dependent on. Uh, uh, just one comment, just can't skip over this. The, the Wall Street Journal, uh, they had, uh, when they were explaining the financial crisis, they basically said, well, SEP, they're just a wolf bank. They have a huge story and then a story. This is a very story. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, this is Andy Kessler. And he said, he's complaining, uh, if you look at their statements, uh, they have one black and one LGBT report member. 
Uh, I'm not saying 12 white men would have avoided this mess, but the company may have been distracted by diversity. Uh, needless to say, that's not what happened here. Uh, next. Uh, so what did the New York State do here? Um, and this is something that I think a lot of people don't quite appreciate, but New York State regulators have completely broad powers to take over banks. Uh, if they've uh, violated the law, they're operating in an unsafe or unsound manner, which is a little squishy what that means. Uh, but they have the, uh, the ability to take over a, a big bank like Signature Bank, which is exactly what they did here. Now, granted, this time they took it over just to immediately hand it over to the FDIC, like hot potato, to then sell all the assets at the price that they get. Uh, but uh, this is something we might want to keep in mind for the future. Um, sorry, did you say that was New York City or State? State. Uh, if I said New York City, I was going to. Um, so, uh, are other banks at risk? Uh, that's a question that a lot of people have in their mind. First Republic Bank is one that's been kind of teetering on the edge. It looks a lot like SDB. Uh, it has a lot of uh, wealthy California tech startups. Um, a lot of the other banks, as a show of class solidarity and bankers, uh, injected about thirty billion dollars into the bank uh, as you know, unsecured depositors. Uh, S and P, the rating agency, they kind of didn't buy that. They weren't convinced that it was helpful, and they still kind of downgraded First Republic. So it's still kind of uh, in iffy territory. Uh, with a little asterisk that there's strong indications that things were bailed out. Uh, also, people haven't talked about this as much, but Credit Suisse, uh, another big financial institution, has basically failed and been bought out by UBS. Uh, and uh, this is significant because this combined entity, it's going to have more than $5 trillion of assets. It's going to be one of the biggest institutions uh, on the planet. Uh, and uh, the financial times said to confirm its place as the bank of choice for the world super rich. Uh, another thing to keep in mind, Moody's, we talked about them before, they downgraded the entire US banking system. Like they literally downgraded the entire US banking system and <laughs> said it's uh, rapidly deteriorating uh, operating environment. Uh, so what is the federal government doing? Uh, I think we'll also talk about this in some more detail later. Uh, but uh, next slide. Uh, Joe Biden, uh, the government did a type systemic risk exception, bailed out all of the unsecured depositors for the banks. Uh, uh, also, the Federal Reserve, they set up what's called a bank term funding program, where uh, we were talking uh, before uh, about how all these banks were putting on paper losses and they would have to sell their assets at loss to get some withdrawals. Uh, what the Federal Reserve is doing is basically opening up a program to lend uh, to them on terms that are important we'll talk about right now, uh, to avoid that uh, them realizing those losses. Uh, and this is a, um, a chart from the FDIC. I just want to point out that the uh, Federal Reserve and lending to all these banks is absolutely tremendous right now. It's more than it was during the COVID pandemic. And it's more than it was during the um, 2008 financial crisis. Uh, so they've been more involved than they have in the past on this one. Uh, so who benefits from these policies? Uh, for one, the banks, it's kind of obvious. Uh, they had about $263 billion in net income, as reported by the FCIC last year. It was even more the year before that. Of course, uh, eventually, if your bank fails, you're not going to get that salary. But you keep the salary that you made over the years and the profits that they made uh, in the past years are significant. Uh, and those are you know, privatized, you know, the, the losses of some of these things are socialized. Uh, next, uh, this is a report from the New York State Comptroller. Um, so the securities industry is different from the banking industry, but they're very closely related. Uh, sorry, James, can you speak oh, up just a little bit? Yes, yeah, so thank you. Yeah. Uh, so the securities industry in New York. It's not quite the same as the, the banking industry, but I just wanted to point out uh, that the Comptroller did another report that the average salary in the securities industry in New York is more than half a million dollars. The average salary per person is more than half a million dollars. Uh, so these are the folks that kind of buy and sell these financial assets, but I think we'll talk a little bit more uh, later. Um, also, don't have time to go into this in detail, 
But when you've got all this money sloshing around the system, uh, financialized real estate uh, also is very significantly impacted by that. Uh, so this is uh, a report from the United Nations from a few years back uh, that it folks have the time to read on their own. Uh, but they kind of identify that the influx of capital from the finance industry is having a big impact on housing prices uh, and also rates. Uh, also, the crypto coin people, who, uh, cryptocurrency people who have been bailed out, uh, they're feeling pretty happy about getting their money back that they've been using. Uh, so what's happening in the real economy? Uh, touched on uh, the connection between finance and real estate before, uh, but a lot of folks have been worried about that lately. This is from the Wall Street Journal. Um, as all of these failed banks are selling off their assets, they're the worry that that will cause a reduction in value of a lot of real estate assets. So the Wall Street Journal says uh, most of these banks have been slow to mark down the value of their loans to reflect recent pressure on the commercial property market. Real estate executives and analysts expect that the sale of signatures debt will help establish new price levels, resetting values uh, uh, lower than uh, where many banks put them on the balance sheets. Uh, likewise, they're worried that the sale of mortgage backed securities is going to have the same effect of lowering values. Uh, this is from uh, The Real Deal, which is a landlord uh, trade publication. Uh, and they've uh, identified the same issue. They've got their own agenda, but they've identified that uh, New York Community Bank didn't buy signature banks, uh, multifamily loans, because they know they were shit. Uh, so they're saying that these things are worth a lot less than people are uh, marketing them in their books. Uh, this is also from the IMF identifying similar concerns. They're worried about broader correction in the real estate uh, valuations. They think it's going to be overvalued. Price correction, uh, and that this will have a bad uh, impact on landlords. Uh, and finally, uh, you know, why do we care about these studies if the bankers uh, and financial institutions suffer from losses? You know, is it just too bad, so sad? Uh, but this is uh, Bloomberg from just a few days ago, and they noted that there's been a reduction in lending, which is the consequence of some of these studies. Uh, commercial bank lending dropped nearly you know, by billion dollars. In the two weeks ended March 29th, and this is the, uh, the most that they've seen uh, on record. So I'll uh, just start wrapping up. Uh, yeah, and, and most of it's been a decline yeah, in lending ever since they started to the records in the Okay. Uh, so just to wrap it up, what is the socialist response to this? I had to go back to 1848. Uh, Marx and Engels recommended centralization of credit in the hands of the state by means of the national bank. Uh, 20 years later, Mark is saying the same thing about the capital. Uh, next, uh, this is Yanis Marafakis, uh, who describes himself as a, an erratic Marxist. Uh, he wrote an article that the banks burn. You know, no longer need to rely on any private rent seeking, socially destabilizing network of banks, uh, and it's time to blow up in the banking system. Uh, this is from uh, Bill and Riley. In Sidecar, which is, I think, affiliated with uh, the New Left Review. And he says basically um, uh, what the plan of the humanity need is massive investment in low return, low productivity activities, care, education, and environmental restoration. Catholic can't do this and basically take it over the banks is the way forward. Uh, and then next, and finally, uh, just to maybe put this up for some discussion later. There is legislation in New York that's currently um, uh, it's out there right now that would allow for a network of public municipal banks across the state. So there are some folks who are organizing kind of uh, along the same lines. But uh, with that, uh, that's the end of my slides. And I can uh, pass it over to Emily. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, James did a lot of heavy lift here. So, and just to remind you, I come from like a pretty mainstream economics publication and work with the Fed. So, my point here is I'm not necessarily even like advocating for this. I'm just trying to shed light on like what someone who's like sitting in the Fed might be thinking right now, I guess. Um, okay. Okay. So, and, and also, some of this might be reviewing. 
sort of taking us a step back to uh, not just this specific crisis. But anyway, so the SVB bank run was like a very, it was like a true classic bank run, like the one that if you've seen the movie, it's a wonderful life. It's what happened. Like, and that's that's something we really haven't seen a ton of in recent years. Like, I mean, we haven't seen huge ones. Um, so it's just a little funny that it wasn't wasn't anything sneaky or just a classic bank run, which was should have been protected by the FDIC, but uh, people just had like uh, deposits way over the FDIC limit, so it became an issue. Um, but also, sort of notably, just from the economics world. Like Ben Bernanke won the Nobel Prize last year for his work on bank runs. So uh, this is sort of just very much uh, in the I guess, economic side of heads to something sort of ironically happening. Um, I guess I didn't talk about my family or some things there. But um, basically, what like an important element of bank runs is that it's a self fulfilling prophecy. And so the FJC is set up. So that we ensure it and people don't feel like the need to rush and devalue assets. But this didn't happen because there were deposits way over the limit. And so people didn't still rush and sort of fulfill the prophecy. Um, so anyway, uh, and I guess like also important context that probably all of you know is that in the Great Depression, there were just bank runs for like for three years after the stock market crisis, and they just kept rolling and rolling, and that is what prompted the FDIC to be formed. So, in the mind of like central bankers and economists, bank runs and financial crises are like very scary things that need to be stopped from spreading. Um, and I have been thinking of all of the policy options as sort of these five axes. So the first being bank regulation and supervision, which is done at the level of the Federal Reserve and at the state level. Um, the and then the Fed acts as the bank, the bankers of the banks um, or the lender of last resort. Um, that's sort of separate. You know, that's like at each crisis, the Fed can lend. Um, then there's monetary policy, uh, which is sort of also its own separate thing, interest rate policy. Then there's fiscal policy, which uh, we know about, but you know, think of it as the stimulus checks or relief checks um, during the pandemic, and then other antitrust and regulatory policy. And I guess my take on the current situation is that Fed policy, which I'm talking about monetary and lender of last resort actions, are kind of in the last maybe like 20 years sort of compensating for a total absence of competent fiscal policy and other regulatory policy. And so I'm sort of, uh, can we go to the next slide? So I think like sort of at a federal and state level, we're sort of failing at, uh, at we, we made some good progress in bank regulation and supervision during the uh, financial crisis, but then some of it was reeled back uh, in 2019. Um, I think most people are pointing to bank supervisors as being a big issue in the SVB uh, failure. Uh, fiscal policy, I think that there's like a major lack of, re I think we all agree, there's like a major lack of redistribution and taxation at the state and federal level, and then yeah, regulation. Um, so and next slide, but I would kind of argue that the Fed in both monetary policy and being the lender of last resort uh, is like not perfectly, but basically out of necessity kind of picking up the slack and putting patches on the uh, Larger economic system. Now, sorry. Okay, this is just education. Uh, Friedman Schwartz wrote this book. We all probably hate Milton Friedman, uh, rightfully, uh, but he was, he and Anna Schwartz were the, some of the like first people to comment that during the Great Depression, the failure of the Fed to act and um, stimulate the economy was a major part of the contagion and the spreading of the Great Depression to all over the US and also internationally. Um, this is their book, not I guess in the United States. Next slide. Uh, oh, also, I mean, like, uh, just for nerds, um, they're also kind of credited with starting um, the using natural experiments uh, in empirical social sciences uh, in this book. So they try to like really isolate um, periods of time when the Fed was contracting 
for research, like they try to isolate the contraction as sort of a pseudo experiment to see how this monetary fluctuations are affecting the broader economy. So you might not love them, but they are important, uh, I guess, intellectually. Okay, makes sense. Um, then, like a really popular blog at the beginning of the Great uh, Recession looked at like globally what was going on and compared it to the Great Depression. And you can see on the left that uh, the like global industrial output was tanking at the same rate as things were in red was the Great Recession and in blue is the Great Depression and things were sort of following its own path. But what was different was that the money supply was being increased sort of uh, much at a much greater pace. Um, and although these charts don't really show you, the you know we kind of know that the red line turns around way before three years, which is how long it took uh, the Great Depression to sort of start correcting. Um, so I'm just sort of arguing for why economists have sort of coalesced around the importance of uh, expanding money supply in a moment when they think there might be a crisis. Okay, next slide. And then this is uh, another historical paper from the Great Depression. Okay, so this is the state of Mississippi, and they're using this. Uh, the top half of Mississippi is in the one district, one Federal Reserve district, um, and the bottom half is in a different Federal Reserve district. Um, and those districts in the 30s had different policies. In the Atlanta Feds district, which is the southern district, um, they followed an ex sort of expansionary expand credit when people need it, um, be a lender of last resort. And in the northern district, they thought that credit should contract during recessions, kind of like a don't ease things for people, let, let the let the dead weight burn off, um, was sort of the theory. And the dots, which are more concentrated in the north, are bank failures. And there's obviously much more bank failures in places where the Fed was not stepping in. And there's much fewer in the bottom. And then they kind of use this as a case study to say, like, okay, let's look at what happened in the economies of these two places. And basically, income and sales and business activity died in the north and stayed in strong. Actually, it also died because it was the Great Depression, but it died less in the south. And so they're using it as like, a, okay, we should probably try to help banks when we can. Okay, so those are basically like how economists have thought about. Bank crises, financial crises, um, and that's like the school I was uh, taught in. Um, and then I guess one additional thing is that uh, I think that like really importantly, the actions. So yeah, I think James basically covered this, but the the actions taken by the U.S. government have been pretty extreme to like fully. Uh, back all of the uh, deposits at the Silicon Valley Bank that were not actually covered by the FDIC. And I think the New York Times made the point that these actions were meant to send a message to America. There's no reason to pull your money out of the banking system. And this, like, I think is a really important point also. I think that, like, in this moment, um, economically, people are feeling sort of perhaps rightfully tenuous. Like, I guess the job market looks good. But inflation hasn't really come down. Everyone feels like the shoe is, is that the phrase? The shoe is going to drop. Yeah, everyone feels like the other shoe is going to drop. And so I think that, like, thinking about things in that context, uh, it's not so shocking to me that policymakers would want to be like, like, let's just like save everything and put everyone's mind at ease because we're scared that if we don't, things will just like fly off the wall. So, and then there's evidence about that, you know, um, I guess that, I guess there's a lot of evidence, I guess, in the economic literature about just how much people's confidence and uh, perception of the economy impact the actual economy. Next slide. And so uh, my one example about uh, research on that is that um, there's a lot of research on the Great Depression, again, on both FDR's inauguration speech and um, the fireside chats during the uh, you know, New Deal and stuff. And um, this is a map where studies looks at places where there were and were not radios and uses that to say like, okay, places that could hear the fireside chat, their economies did better because 
they just felt more confident in what was going on. And places that didn't have radios did worse. You don't have to believe this. I'm just sort of <laughs> pitching you something. Um, but there's also a thing that looks at like um, economic indicators. I guess it must have been bank data. I guess right after FDR's inauguration speech, and everyone kind of argues that like we like you know took a strong stance and was like we're going to save the economy, and it just like buoyed everyone's mood, and the economy was saved. And I, I'll just tell a quick story, which is that. One of my advisors uh, was the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors under Obama in 2009. Her name is Christina Romer, and she told the story about the FDR inauguration to Barack Obama and said, like, you got to, like, get people hyped, like, tell them you're going to save the economy. And he didn't. He just had <laughs> this campaign of, like, hope and and change and all this, and then got on the like stand at the inauguration and was kind of like morose. And my advisor and her husband both were like, oh God. <laughs> so that was their like sort of funny story about trying to show people how much expectations matter and messaging matters. Um, anyway, so those are just a few of my, those are a few of my thoughts about what's going on um, sort of from an economist standpoint. Um, I definitely am like, I want to just redistribute all the wealth away from the tech people and regulate them a lot more. Uh, I think this is also important. I think asset bubbles are what coming up a lot in James's, uh, James's as part of the presentation. And um, I think that like, yeah, redistribution and, and regulation would severely help with that. But as a society, we're over committed to Area to like high growth, um, so we have trouble regulating and achieving. Um, bank supervision, which is distinct from bank regulation, is a really understudied topic. People don't know very much about it at all. I actually worked on it a little bit at the Fed, and it's just like a dearth. There's a dearth of knowledge, and to the extent that there is knowledge, it's like, oh yeah, like there's a revolving door of like being a banker and then being a bank supervisor. <laughs> like it's kind of a well-known fact when we at the Fed that the Supervisors have been bankers themselves and are just buddies, so they're not going to do a great job at their job. Um, I don't really understand ratings agencies, and I also think that's understudied and under and not understood well, and they should be doing a better job. Uh, um, fiscal policy, we all agree there should be better fiscal policy. Um, yeah, I have the viewpoint that Fed policy is very blunt and disappointing, but it has actually been important to stability over the last 15 years or whatever. Um, and I think that there's also good evidence that like easing, monetary easing from the Federal Reserve is on the whole progressive, not regressive. So I just am kind of for the Fed to be kind of being easy with money, but that's just me. Okay, that's it. Okay, I don't have slides because slides made the challenge blow well, up. <laughs> uh, my two predecessors have reviewed many of the reasons why we've had these bad failures. Um, you know, the long term treasury bonds, which lost values as uh, interest rate throws, uh, the delusional idiocies of cryptocurrencies. Um, but there seems to be a broad feeling that these are isolated incidents, uh, and maybe so, but that will that would be unusual that these are isolated. Uh, I'll return to that in a bit. But according to the FDIC data, uh, James cited, there are plenty of unrealized losses on the books of uh, many many banks. Uh, they've lightened up some on their bond holdings in uh, recent weeks, but they still have over four trillion remaining, which means they still are pretty exposed uh, if interest rates go any higher from here. But I want to don my hard money Marxist identity and talk some about what got us here. Uh, and I agree with Emily that the Fed is it's one of the few remaining competent, competent institutions in this country. They know what they're doing. It's run by serious people. Uh, and I can't say that about a lot of the rest of the institutions in the society. Um, but it makes sense to uh, cut rates and print money in a crisis. But it became standard operating procedure over the last couple of decades. And I think that has some very serious side effects. We had a decade of near 0% interest rates, uh, trillions of free money the Fed printed. Uh, this created vast hordes of cash jostling around the financial system looking for a profitable home. 
with interest rates near zero, you just can't buy you know bonds and make some money on them. So it makes you, as they say, reach for yield. You take ever more risky uh, bets and total to pay out. In Silicon Valley Bank's cases and some other cases, they bought long bonds, uh, which turned out to be a big mistake. And one that bank management and rate regulators largely ignored, some of the regulators knew about it but did nothing. San Francisco Fed probably has an idea of what's going on. With San Francisco, Silicon Valley Bank, they, they wrote some internal reports that sounded pained, but they didn't actually do anything about it. Um, then, you know, all these other people with all this money sloshing around put money into startups, tech stocks, crypto, other risky assets, uh, even sneakers. There's a credit boom in sneakers. Um, and it also raised real estate prices, uh, housing prices, uh, and led to a great deal of rent inflation and put housing out of the reach of a lot of people. So um, that loose money had a very uh, negative effect uh, on uh, because of this rise in asset prices had a negative effect on people's you know, fundamental needs. Um, now, some of these things have lost value uh, as the Fed has tightened, but Bitcoin is back over $30,000 for the first time in nearly a year. And why it's worth more than zero is a mystery to me. <laughs> uh, stocks are down some, but not enormously. So we're still, you know, there's a lot of froth left in this financial system. The Fed has withdrawn some of the trillions and spent years injecting into the system. Uh, uh, but there's still an awful lot of its money sloshing around. Uh, and so as, as they withdraw, as interest rates rise, we're seeing some of these crunchy effects in, in the financial system and the real economy. But uh, Still, quite a ways to go if they want to reverse it. But we've had 40 years now of deregulation, lax supervision, speculative manias, and then busts followed by big bailouts. I'm old enough to remember of the failure of Penn's, the, remember the failure of Penn Square Bank and Continental Illinois in the early 1980s. And since then, it's been just one after another every few years. The owning class hasn't taken a serious hit since 1929. Uh, the 1%, the 1.1%, the 0.01% have seen their share of income and wealth rise almost without break over the decades. In past financial crises, they took, they took a very serious hit. Uh, and capitalists are supposed to take risks, which means losing money. Uh, and God knows if you own a restaurant, you're taking serious risks, you may well lose your shirt. But bank owners and the owning class in general haven't suffered a serious blow in the early century. Now there's a new wrinkle, the explosion of uninsured deposits. There was an excess of the FDIC's nominal limit of 250,000. In earlier bank failures, like those in the 1980s, uninsured depositors lost money. <laughs> this time, the authorities decided to cover every stated reason was to prevent runs from other institutions. That may be true, but that's not without its problems. Mr. Yeah. Adam Hill, uh, vice chair of the FDIC, said the other day, generally the deposit insurance systems are designed to strike a balance between reducing the risk of runs and providing people a safe place to put their money with promoting market discipline and limiting the socialization of deposit failures. One of the core principles from the International Association of Deposit Insurers, had no idea they had a trade association, which they do, says coverage should be limited, credible, and cover the large majority of depositors, but leave a substantial amount of deposits exposed to market discipline. How we've thrown that out the way. But this doesn't really seem like a great precedent. So all, are all these crises over, as some are saying? Well, no, I think not. We're seeing tightening credit conditions uh, over the last several weeks. Uh, we've seen the banking system overall lose deposits at a rapid clip. And within that, a migration from smaller banks into bigger ones, meaning less money for smaller banks to lend, and a retrenchment uh, in so-called commercial and industrial loans, the uh, loans to real-world businesses. The with withdrawal of deposits from smaller banks is a windfall for the big ones, like Chase and uh, Bank of America, but that's going to reduce lending at smaller banks, which should be important to, to you know, mom and pop Main Street, you know, the cliche you want to use for that. Uh, that plus more cautious credit standards uh, is uh, another reason to expect a recession uh, sometime in the near future. And uh, recession probably means more financial coming, uh, financial problems coming our way. Historically, uh, financial crises have generally followed slowdowns in the real economy, not led them. And we're slowing down. So uh, I think there's a good reason to expect more of this in the near future. Uh, in releasing its by uh, annual, um, what, twice a year, <laughs> semi annual, uh, World Economic Outlook in, uh, a few days ago, the IMF said side effects from the fast, fast rise in policy interest rates are becoming apparent as banking sector vulnerabilities have come into focus and fears of contagion have risen across the broader financial sector. 
risk of the outlook are heavily skewed to the downside, the chances of a hard landing have risk, hard landing having risen sharply. The fund's chief economist, I won't subject to my French and pronounce his name, told the Financial Times, while well, the banking system was far more resilient than in 2008, policymakers had to think about what could go wrong. We all remember the long time between the failure of an individual institution like Bear Stearns or Countrywide a decade ago. Every time this was treated as an isolated incident until it wasn't. Be worried that inflation is proving stickier than hope despite the easing uh, in uh, US inflation last month. The quarter rate rate remains very high, which probably means more monetary tightening and more downside risks. So we're confront confronting a venerable dilemma. Tightening can provoke financial crises and cry out for easing. That wasn't so much of a problem during the four decades of low inflation. It is now. A couple of concluding observations. What would a better financial system look like? I was struck by that Dylan Riley piece in the New Left Review website last week uh, for a couple of reasons. One, arguing that the Green New Deal is bad, which I can't agree with. Um, but that, that also we need to socialize the financial system, which would be a lovely thing to do, but I think we're really nowhere near that happening anytime soon. And if, if there's a way in which saying something like that is a nice way to get yourself off the hook from saying anything of real political consequence. Uh, we need to squeeze the financial system hard, though, and it, I guess it's almost as utopian as, as, as uh, uh, seizing it again. It sometimes feels that way. But reduce the scope and regulate it tightly and end the endless cycle of bailouts. Bloomberg News ran a story this morning that included a quote from uh, David Singer, chair of MIT's political science department. Canada manages, manages to have wonderfully boring banks. The recipe for stability is to have well capitalized, risk averse banks. Banks won't necessarily naturally gravitate towards such behavior. They need thorough and steady regulation that doesn't eat up, ease up when the economy is coming. So maybe we should aspire to Canadian levels of boredom. And then there's the possibility of public banking, which is something that James has worked on, which he mentioned, uh, about which I know too little, but something we should consider very seriously. But there's something else about Canada's banking system. It's highly concentrated, you know, uh, dominated by four giant national banks, which brings me to a broader point. Social democracy seems to thrive in economic systems with more concentrated ownership than others. Something like a third of corporate Sweden is owned by one family, the Wallenberg. This is an unfashionable point to make at a time when much of the liberal left is talking about increased competition and antitrust action. But increased competition is not a socialist value, and larger entities are perversely easier to regulate than smaller ones. Uh, I think uh, another thing we can do is tax away the wealth of the top 1%. I don't mean that really as a, a regular revenue raising strategy, because if we do it right, that money will be gone and they will be undone as a class. That's I think should be. the goal of taxing the rich should be to end them as a class or at, great, at least greatly reduce their power. And then without all that money, there will be so much money sloshing around to stabilize. But finally, in denouncing easy money policies, I don't want to argue against policies that increase the security and welfare of the working class. For a brief period during the heat of the COVID crisis, we had a generous welfare state, expanded unemployment benefits, healthcare, broader health care coverage, and child allowances. These things really make people's lives easier. They should be made, made permanent and expanded. They weren't the byproduct of easy money. They're the result of the government writing people checks. That's what we need more of. Over the long sweep of capitalist history, easy credit booms always end in inflation and busts, and they're not the way to guarantee a stable prosperity. Easy money has a great appeal in, the Ameri in American society. It's a dream of small businesses, which, doesn't have, which don't have any problem with capitalism, just being capitalists. I think we need to do better than that. Um, we thought we'd briefly give the panelists a chance to respond to each other, and then we'll open it up for questions, conversation. Um, so uh, maybe just go in the same order again. James, do you want to start out? And everyone, we do have Zoom to try to project. Be sure to project. Not much to uh, to say about that. Uh, both of your presentations. Uh, I looked at the map of where the radios were from the United States. Um, yeah, uh, maybe to uh, uh, work backwards on the other end, um, there's uh, the issue of public banking, which is, uh, I mean, the devil is very much in the details for, for something like that. Uh, but uh, I guess my reaction would be that this is something that 
there's interesting historical precedents for something like this, both across the, the, the world, uh, other places do it, particularly the BRICS countries do it when we do. It's been done in the United States, North Dakota. Um, there's, it, it's also kind of a, a, a tricky history that also has, uh, in, as I said, the devil's in the details. Uh, you've had public banks also within the United States. Uh, and there's an interesting book that came out recently, I haven't finished yet, like uh, Banking and Slavery, about how you know banks can be used for, for bad purposes. So you've got to be very careful about these things. And uh, the federal government had basically a uh, kind of a federal level public bank with construction finance corporation for decades that, uh, uh, again, that one's kind of complicated and it ties into the New Deal stuff that uh, Emily was talking about before. Uh, but when people write about it, uh, th there's a book about that called, I think, Saving Capitalism, where it's kind of perceived as uh, a way of perpetuating certain capitalist um, terms and uh, economic relationships. But uh, yeah, I'm particularly interested in what how this impacts real world stuff going forward. Uh, policies going forward in the future. Yeah, um, I agree. I really enjoyed listening to both of you. I think um, I think I agree with. Okay, like I would love to see a public a public banking sector public bank, and I'm really interested to know more about what's going on in the legislature in your state legislature. Um, but I maybe am with Doug that we're, we're far from having that as a solution. So I think um, talking about things that I guess uh, to me it seems like supervision and regulation of banks is like one area where we can like really think about policy uh, options that could you know kind of squeeze squeeze their power uh, significantly. Um, and I think that needs to be thought of in a really broad way. I think like banks, uh, you know, classical banks actually have, well, actually this is kind of interesting because I guess some of the regulation that I've done, but in the wake of the financial crisis, a lot of the risky behavior sh shifted into like non-bank financial institutions. So we have to think very broadly about the financial institutions that we're including in the regulatory frameworks. Um, and I think, Doug and I probably have like slightly different opinions on easy money, but maybe not. Like I think I just think that there's is a role for a lender of last resort and monetary policy to respond to crisis. And I don't really know what should have been done over the like 10 years between 2010 and 2020. And not like it's been such a strange episode. And I'm not sure if people, you know, yeah, I certainly don't feel like an expert on like what it, what would have been a better plan from the like easy money perspective but i'm cautious to say that like easy money was the problem like in much the same way that i feel like i wouldn't want to blame like lending like easing mortgage lending to low-income households i wouldn't want to blame that for the financial crisis like i wouldn't want to blame like financial e like uh, monetary easing for like a problem that's like really concentrated in my opinion in like top wealth holders, which seems like something that, that could be addressed through a fiscal like taxation response or regulatory response. So the reality is that monetary policy just is kind of blunt in what it can do. And anyway, so I guess that's my response. Um, maybe a couple of points. Um, first of all, I think the housing bubble of you know, 2000 two to six or seven, whatever, whatever exactly the dates were, um, involved lending people a lot of money who really couldn't afford to pay it back. So uh, that's, you know, it was nice while it lasted, but that's not gonna work for a long term housing policy. Uh, you know, we need public housing, we need rent control, we need things like you know, public policies that make housing affordable and takes it out of the realm of uh, speculative assets. Uh, there's a financial times years ago about the woman who's living in the heart of London and um, as she put it, it really is painful to live in the middle of an asset class. And there's something wrong with it, is the way housing is a financial asset. You know, it's one of life's essentials. And we're trained in the US to think of 
a healthy housing market, one that's rising. But you know, that means that one of life's essentials is getting more expensive out of more people's reach. Uh, the most recent housing boom, driven mainly by upper bracket people, where there was no subprime borrowing at all. But you know, they did um, raise housing prices across the country and drive up rents as well. So that, that was a very bad thing. Um, one of the things that happened after the 2010 crisis was, uh, or 2008 crisis, starting from 2010 onward, was, well, let's go back, almost three months after taking office, Obama called up David Brooks, or somebody representing Obama called up David Brooks, and said, you know, after this crisis is over, we want to start cutting Medicare and Social Security. So he, like, immediately on the phone, almost immediately on the phone, we're still in the midst of this crisis, and he's already talking about austerity. And that's what part of what happened after the you know the worst of the crisis passed was real tightening of not just federal but also state and local spending, uh, which is exactly what we didn't do. And I think Emily has a point in saying the Fed is doing things or was doing things that the fiscal side should have been doing and that public policy should have been doing, and it wasn't. But I think it's a very poor substitute. And the thing is, you know, undemocratic institutions, mm -hmm. opaque. Um, but it's also run by really smart and competent people. Uh, and um, so they don't always do things that we want, but they do, uh, they know what they're doing in ways that uh, the rest of the federal government, the government, the state, and local government just have, has no clue of. So um, that, that's a problem that we have. The um, most competent institution in society is one that largely represents the interests of the upper class. They've been trying to diversify over the last few years. Jay Powell's gotten all sensitive about poverty, which is a remarkable thing. Um, but um, you know, they're not the institution. Um, so let's open up for responses, Q and A. Um, I'll try to keep a stack um, more or less, but I also might just say questions. And I already have one from the Zoom too, but I'll take a few in the room first, and then. Um, so I saw Ben in the back to start, and then I see a Trinity here. Yeah. Ben. Um, I uh, well, a comment is um, well. I guess that there are really two things to take out of the conversation. One is kind of like what we should do or call for as socialists, um, and there's some debate about that. But I also kind of think that to a certain extent, I don't think a real blue sky. Probably because it's like what you can call for really depends on how much political power you have, and we have we don't have the political power to do like almost anything. Um, so then the second thing is like what to expect or anticipate, like how a crisis might unfold. This has been a really useful conversation for me with that because I think figuring out what might happen will kind of determine where we actually might be and what kind of organizing might be done and where the crisis might be that you could like would produce the conditions to like call for certain kind of policies. That's just a comment. And then my second question about that sort of disagreement um, is. It's going to be kind of too stereotypically a Marxist, but isn't this just like a contradiction of capitalism that on the one hand, it's correct that if you didn't bail out Silicon Valley Bank, there was a potential for like uh, essentially like uh, multiplying forms of crises as, as different banks, as different smaller banks collapse. But at the same time, what you end up doing is essentially bailing out, bailing out a lot of Silicon Valley investors with unprofitable companies who you know, probably are the kind of people who should take a, a loss. Um, and is, it, is that just a kind of a underlying contradiction of our economy manifesting? So I guess what I'm asking is, how much of this is ultimately down to the fact that the solution to the housing crisis was cheap money to prop up a lot of really speculative stuff that, you know, I think of Uber, you know, it's, it's entire business model is just to put everybody else out of business uh, and it's never really made any, any money. You know, it just, it, it's a completely fictitious um, thing that's completely kind of like upended, you know, tens of thousands of people's lives based on, you know, super cheap investment in like a pie in the sky thing that's probably never going to happen. Um, how much of, of this is down to the fact that a lot of the, a lot of our economy just doesn't really work once you raise interest rates? Me. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I think, okay, I actually kind of forget the first half of your question, but so <laughs> uh, the second half, I agree with you. And actually, maybe I haven't been clear, but I, so I think that, um, yeah, I think that there's like 
I mean, my read of the room, basically, not this room, like the broader room, is um, like, yeah, like there's a chasing for yield. People are looking for some high growth area of the economy. And right now that's in, been in the tech sector that people are like, okay, we have, we, there's growth, but it's, a lot of it is speculative and empty. And that's going to be a thing that we're going to have to reckon with. I agree with that completely. Um, I personally think from like a policy perspective, that's just not like, banking or monetary policy like I think like okay I'm operating in the world of we have private banks at like it would be a separate conversation if they were working with public banks with the public banking sector but in the world that we're in in the U.S. right now like I think that we have to be able to put out fires <laughs> and that's maybe very like mainstream captain's view but uh it's just a concern about the contagion issue and I think that the other issue is like where, what sectors actually have real fundamental growth and where is it all speculative. And, and to me, that's an issue that's more at the level of regulation and redistribution and sort of federal policy. Um, um, yeah. You know, a friend of mine years ago was thinking about writing a book called The Nothing Based Economy. And <laughs> yeah. um, I thought she had a point, and I wish she'd agree with so, sort of like this one. Um, <laughs> as it might. I'm in no position to like, wag my finger at But yeah, we do have right. this, like, you know, as you say, Uber is just ridiculous. But, you know, that Uber is rel relatively like, serious compared to some of the nonsense they've been financing over the last several years. Um, and, you know, all this like, worship of tech as in innovation, I can't think of much of anything that is really done for anybody. Um, although, you know, it's a good idea in the sense that it makes sense to summon a cab with an app. But if we're like an employee cooperative rather than this ridiculous corporation that can't make money, um, you know, it might be a better way of doing things. But, you know, this, this tech, even compared to the late 90s, uh, when we had a, a you know, tremendous bubble around back then, but what they're doing then was far more useful than they could be created now. I don't know really much. Well, I guess, you know, yeah, yeah uh, that GPT will change everything. Um, but um, as for that contradiction of capitalism you're identifying, that's absolutely right. Uh, and, you know, to some degree, the hard ass Austrians are right that capitalism doesn't work without failure. And so now we've had this welfare like, state for big capitalists uh, for decades now, and they don't really suffer any consequences. Right? Certainly, the working class suffers all kinds of consequences. Um, but um, once you reach a certain status level in society, um, then um, you know you're, you're safe. Uh, you're, you're you're almost guaranteed not to fall. And capitalism just doesn't work very well. Um, and so I don't know. It's really a problem. Um, and uh, and it's one point I was one I was going to make this uh, in, in the body of my presentation. I thought I'd make it now. It sort of came up. Uh, the figure of Barney Frank. Um, Barney Frank, you know, his name is on the Dodd Frank regulations uh, while they came out of the financial crisis. Soon after that passed, Barney joined the board of Signature Bank, where he made $2 million and kind of lobbied against uh, his own regulations. Uh, and he wanted Signature not to be subject to the stress tests and all sorts of things that and, and scrutiny that larger banks were subject to under Dodd Frank. Uh, and he said, of course, he made this really contentious interview with. Uh, I said chocolate the deal. I don't know anybody who agrees with anything with Isaac Chocolate, but he did. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he he said to Chocolate that it was cynical to see any connection between his board service and his call for easy regulation. But you know, that's that's part of what goes on. So we have this one thing where we just generally have amnesia after a crisis and we just go back and do the same old shit all over again. But then you have personalities like uh, Bernie Frank, who's supposed to be one of the good guys, who ended up being a bad guy. Uh, and that, that kind of first level of personal corruption to be systemically important. I need to make money. Yeah, he had no pension. Yeah. He didn't participate in the congressional pension system. <laughs> <laughs> um, if, a few more questions. Leslie is on. Uh, okay, can this happen to credit unions? And what's the difference between a credit union and a bank? I don't understand. Sure. Uh, if there is a difference, I want. 
Yeah, uh, credit unions is a type of bank. It's regulated differently than the regulatory regime. But one thing that you've been seeing, since they're typically smaller financial institutions, uh, when you've got banks that are too big to fail, then the implication of that is that there are some banks that are smaller. Uh, so you've seen a migration of money from uh, Doug said this early, from some of the smaller institutions to some of the bigger institutions. So they're going a little bit right now. Credit unions also often have more money than they know what to do with. So they don't, they can't really lend it, so they put their treasury. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask you to go a little bit slower uh, over bailouts because, like, I feel like we we're all familiar with the word bailout, mm -hmm. like the mechanics of what's happening, and like to anchor your answers, like particular questions, like if the bailout doesn't happen, right? Uh, first, like, what's the difference between bailout, buyout, FDIC takeover? Second, if the bailout doesn't happen and there is this toxic toxic assets that sink uh, a bank. Like what happens with this assets when uh, the bank is bankrupt, when it's completely failed, if it's not bought out or bailed out or merged into something else. Uh, and then third, um, how, when the bailout ha happens, what, how is the decision made like at what price to buy these assets? And why is it not possible to take over these assets at no price, considering that it is like leverage towards losses so much. Yeah, sure. um, so uh, for that, just broadly overview, uh, first, who is not bailed out? The uh, shareholders and bondholders of the signature uh, banks, Silicon Valley Bank, they were not bailed out. Uh, who was bailed out this time were the uninsured depositors, anyone. Who had more than $22,000 in the bank. I don't think one here has more than $22,000 in one of their bank accounts. Uh, it's, it's mostly uh, rich people, companies, some of them are legitimate companies that uh, you know, have a legitimate business and they just kind of put a whole lot in the bank. Uh, so it's a little bit of a mixture, but it's very awkwardly tilted. Uh, as far as what happens with the bank's assets, uh, so there's a whole mix of things that these banks are holding on to. Uh, and they've got a whole mix of different values that people say that they're worth, which might not be the truth about what they're really worth. So uh, Signature Bank, for instance, was bought out by uh, Flagstar, I think, which is a subsidiary of New York Community Bank. Uh, but they only bought out some of their assets. Other assets, they said, no, this is, this is bullshit. I don't want this. Uh, like, for instance, all their crypto assets where uh, Doug said, I don't know why these things aren't valued at zero, when they put them up for auction and people are looking to buy signature bank's assets, I think a lot of people said, it's probably worth more than zero, more, more like zero than what you say it's worth. I don't want any of that. Uh, it's been the same for some of the commercial real estate loans, uh, but the process has been that these have moved over to the FDIC, which has kind of managed the process of winding down the assets. Uh, which is a little bit more complicated. They like hire, I think Novastar is the name of the one that's responsible for selling off signature bank assets. I don't know what Silicon Valley Bank is doing, but they've got managers selling these things off. And a lot of these things they just can't sell. Uh, and they're they're holding on to, you saw similar stuff happening in 2008, where they're selling off the bank's assets and some of them are toxic assets that are just held uh, for uh, um, by a public uh, oh yeah okay so that's a really good question uh and it's very complicated i guess and james is correct about that okay so but just to like reiterate it um yeah so basically like a bailout in i think the true sense and you can correct me if i'm wrong would actually be if all of the depositors to the bank don't lose any money and the shareholders and um, bond, like the people who loan money to the bank via bonds and the and equity and own equity in the bank, those people also wouldn't lose everything. But it, so in this case, SVB, the shareholders and bondholders actually did lose. Um, and it's the and as James said, the depositors are the ones that got the bailout. And it's been controversial because of that 
over the $250,000 FDIC limit, which is causing people to be like, well, then what's the point of the limit? Like, what, like why do we have a limit if you're just going to bail them out over the limit? Do we just not, is it like functionally not a limit? Um, and the reason that they did it over the limit was because they decided that the bank was systemically important, um, which is to say they had a fear that if they didn't do it, like the fear and distrust would spread and there would be more runs and stuff. Um, I think that we like combined answered the like bailout. Oh, and a buyout is when a bank, a different bank buys the other bank. So like Credit Suisse got bought by UBC. And so for $2 trillion or something. So that means that uh, UBC is like fully, yeah, I mean, like business purchase, taking over all of the Credit Suisse operations and their assets and they do stuff with it. So yeah, did I miss something? Uh, the Swiss government paid to do it. <laughs> it's not a voluntary transaction. <laughs> voluntary buyouts in history and just like, yeah, um, but I think, well, I don't care. Yeah. One other thing to add on top of that, uh, the, you might have heard people say no one was, no taxpayer money was used for bailouts. Um, that relates to the FDIC, it's kind of like an insurance program where the banks will pay in through fee assessment, or I forget that's the correct phrase. Uh, so all of the banks in the banking system, the insured banking system, kind of pay in. And then the bailout money comes kind of on that is another maybe wrinkle to add in. Um, and actually, and sorry, one last answer that's about the end of your question, which was what is the deal with the asset buying? Um, so part of what the reason why the assets get bought at inflated prices, and this is related to like, it, are we just inflating everything too much? And is this the easy money issue? Part of it is that like, so like the Fed, if the Fed's buying the assets, um, is is very intentionally trying to increase the price of the assets so that people feel like they're at, like the assets that they own are safe and like so for example during like the financial crisis there were like very intentional purchasing of mortgage backed securities to increase the prices of mortgage backed securities and like longer term treasury securities to increase the prices of longer term treasury securities as a way of supporting the economy. So it's, it is an intentional effort on policymakers part to try to like not let the value drop as far as it might drop otherwise. Um, and I think actually, just to be perfectly honest, there is some reason to believe that it's, it in some circumstances is a reasonable thing to do, like during the term asset relief program, which it, like basically supported all of the major banks in the US the financial crisis. Um, you know, their valuations tanked, but by the end, for the most part, things have come back to where, you know, like, basically the point is that, like, in a map from a macroeconomic standpoint, like, the economy swings really far if you don't do anything to, like, help it not oscillate. So the point of, like, supporting the price of an asset would be like, okay, this, it might tank, like, way too far, and it would hurt a lot of people if it tanks super, super far. So we're just going to support it through this, like, rough patch and hope that things return to normal. But, yes, that comes at the cost of, like, now we don't really know what the fundamental value of anything is. So um, is that... Um, just a couple of footnotes to that. One, um, I think the Fed actually made money on the balance. Yes. yes. Um, and all those special purpose vehicles they set up like the ABM and stuff like that stuff, they actually made money and returned it to the Treasury. And I think the Treasury either made money or came close to it from American perspective. Um, you know, that, old, that famous uh, saying from Rothschild, one of the Rothschilds, that the time to buy is when blood is running in the streets. The central bank is essentially doing that. It's like yeah. everybody's freaking out, and that's the time for the strong buyer to come in, and they actually buy, buy at the bottom is where things are. Um, uh, the, I think you asked the question too, what happens if there is no bailout? And this is, uh, uh, um, Emily mentioned this, that Ben Bernanke won a Nobel Prize for this research uh, on the Great Depression, and his argument was that uh, the bank failures were what put the great in Great Depression. It was these cascading bank failures. There were like, I don't know, four or 5,000 of them. Uh, and then when FDR came in, they shut like another 5,000. 
Um, but it was that cascading bank failing that turned a little downturn into a, a very serious crisis. And so, you know, when, when that crisis broke out, I remember thinking, oh, it's good we have Bernanke running there because he understands this very well. And I think he got, like I said, got a little carried away with keeping the going a little too long. But, um, you know, that, that's what happens if you don't have some kind of rescue operation. Everything's still going to be in flow. And it, like it's unpopular to say that, and I remember getting an argument with Ian Baker about this at the time. But uh, uh, if you don't have protected right, if you don't have that, then you have a real serious problems. Okay, I'm the story. The Fed. Okay, sorry. The, when I worked at the Fed, they would talk about how they valued these assets during the crisis, and they were like, "We had no idea. We just like moved numbers around." So they don't know either. <laughs> um, we have a long line just now. I think I have people on it, so if I'm not calling you, it's just because I'm trying to go through the line. Um, so I see you back there, you guys. But um, David, go ahead. Oh, um, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. Um, okay. Yeah. To yeah, I was an asset guy. So I guess I'm much more interested in sort of like I live in New York City, I live in New York State, and banks, they're all around us. So I kind of much more curious about like what regulations or what sort of policy we sort of think about at the local level, just because I feel like at the national level, to some of the points made earlier, we're not we don't have public banks. I just really hard to think of the national level for this stuff, but at the local level, what can we sort of do around some of these issues of regulation and trust and so I mean, regulation, I think it's largely got to be a federal level. We're talking about regular, I mean, we've got the DFS is the state regulator for these banks. Um, uh, so, uh, but the, the extent of their regulations uh, are pretty limited when compared to uh, the uh, uh, federal regulators. I think that, uh, I think it was SBB or um, uh, signature was regulated by the Federal Home Loan Bank. Well, they're not really home loan banks. That's not really exactly what they do. But I, I think it would have to be at the federal level, and that kind of gets at what Doug was talking before about how these medium sized, so called $20 billion, <laughs> medium sized banks uh, had lower regulation uh, applied to them. I'm not sure if that would have fixed things. Uh, and it's kind of a funny fact of all this that uh, this isn't. Uh, a bunch of failures because everyone was holding a bunch of toxic, strange assets. These are normally the safest things that you invest in U.S. Treasuries, uh, and they kind of went down in value. I don't know what you could do um, at the national level to uh, regulate this or what you want them to be holding. Uh, other than that, uh, aside from maybe a diverse mix of things, uh, at the local level, uh, I mean, there's also the wrinkle of at the state and city level. Uh, and this gets an earlier, an earlier question of what do you trust Kathy Hopeful or Eric Adams to be doing with like <laughs> these regulations? Yeah. Uh, so uh, there, there's an uh, interesting uh, political dimension to this. My friend Barbara Gerst wrote a book years ago. Um, I think it's called Money Makes the World Go Around. Um, but uh, the premise is she takes her advance check and deposits it in a small bag in the state of New York and tries and imagines. We can't trace a dollar, but she's like, he says, well, Okay, where did this money go? I thought it's and it was not, this bank did not um, lend the money locally. The money they, they had more money than they knew what to do with, so they lent it in the overnight federal funds market to chase. So, and then you know, this what you think you're putting money in a community bank and ends up in chase, and then she like follows, you know, what does chase do with this money? And she's on a petrochemical plant in Singapore. So. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, you think you're up there in Saratoga or something, and you don't realize you're financing petrochemical plant in Singapore would be wild. I would just quickly add like that I was like sort of largely arguing for like taxation and the regulation of the like different sectors that have these asset bubbles. So like I think the tax the rich campaign is actually part of it. And I also think like we can think about, yeah, I would be interested in thinking about sort of a broader regulatory framework for sort of the tax industry generally um, and sort of how they're getting financed and stuff like that. I, I don't know what it looks like yet, but it's sort of different than the banking sector. Um, I remember 10, 15 years ago, the Glass Steagall Act reinstating that was seen as kind of like the leftmost edge of financial policy, uh, including among the rich people. But uh, 
I was wondering why that's kind of gone out of vogue in many ways, and if it's still, you see it as, I know Barney Frank was very against reinstating it, so maybe that is a sign that it is effective, but if you think that's uh, perhaps a distraction or if that is a, a demand, we can still be taking it. I mean, the principle I would think of is that there should be, whether it's public or tightly regulated private, some portion of the financial sector of the banking sector that just does really boring shit, that takes deposits and makes very sound, you know, saving loans, and stays away and is prohibited from doing any reckless stuff. And if the hedge fund guys want to go do their crazy shit, let them go do that. And if they have an accident, bye bye. So, I mean, that, that's not exactly the story of Glass Steagall, but it's a concept for some kind of like to create this sort of utility like banking sector. Mm -hmm. Everybody needs a bank to get that, that can be the savings, you know, basic banking services. Um, but you really want to keep it out of the higher reaches of speculative activity. So, I don't know if that's possible, but it's a concept that's been sort of thinking. <laughs> um, a pretty famous economist would say that, like, one of the reasons why crypto is so overvalued is that you can't short it. Um, so you can't take the downside. You can't take a downside bet on crypto. So it's just like overinflated on the upside. I, that's just a profile. I mean, no, I kind of agree with it, but I don't want you to take that. It's, I don't know what I think. It's the, there's reasons to think that you're just doing it. I'll think deeply. All the men in the back? Probably. Yeah. yeah. I was saying it's kind of blown up a little bit what you're saying. People pay because they want. I think, like, all these all the small banks is going to fail as soon as they all want to go out. There's only going to be the big things left. And the reason why I'm saying that is because, like, even a couple of months ago, we was having a thing in Congress, and, well, I would have to go to it to, to bring it up here, but it's some on YouTube. And it's, it, 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 it's actually from, um, I forgot the name of the lady. She was saying that they're not going to save. Basically, all these small banks, they're not going to save. And when the crisis comes, there's, there's only this certain big slots, so that banks will get saved, which would be the people they want to save. And the crisis is going to come because they want to make the crisis come. If, if, if you're not small enough to get that, they, you know, and I'm not trying to be funny, but they want to make a crisis come. They want to make the small banks fail. If you have money in that dumb banks, they're not going to get protected. So this is letting people know that already. That's going to get people to vote for the big thing. So I think really that's what we should be prepared for. Because I, I'm not trying to play with the people in certain old places are making that happen. You know, it's things that happen behind the doors, whatever. You know, and it, it's all sometimes it's smoke and mirrors. Like even like for the Fed, like the Fed, like the Fed, and it's not even the federal government. So it's like it's all made to make it look like something, and it's they want to make it look like they want to try to do something to small banks, but they want to fill all the small banks, all the fill small banks with interest fed. I mean, it's part of a plan because people that's in, people in power always want to stay in power, and they want to make sure that they want to keep that power, even if it means killing somebody. So what I'm saying is. Hey, maybe people should get more prepared for something like that. Because I, I don't think there's gonna be no safety or no, I'm not gonna cut this real short, but I don't think there's gonna be no safety or no expensive safety that you're gonna be able to get when that's the way the money's going. And, you know, um, basically also the crypto is just gonna lead to the dollar anyway, because they want to be the dollar. So I mean I didn't think people should be prepared for those things to over like the reality that is happening to see it coming. And you've already seen a bit of that migration from the small banks to the, the big banks, uh, because people, I think, rightly perceive maybe some of these small banks are small enough to fail. Yeah, they want to build a big one, too small to live. The politicians love small banks, though. Like, maybe Bankers Association is really popular in Columbia. They know, but it's just like they love small business, too, uh, at least for poor. They do really have. No collective political power, but they're just like simple. What you are saying is, what could we do as people? What could we do as people to be prepared ourselves and individually oh, for the moment that happens, for that happens? So that's what I'm trying to say. Could we, what could yeah. we prepare ourselves for that? Some like individual education on what would be how to prepare for bank failures and financial collapse. 
Uh, it's a tough one. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, if, you, if your deposit's under two fifty, two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and uh, just like kind of pray the U.S. government doesn't go down. <laughs> I <think that's> <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have one uh, Zoom question, and then I'm going to keep going. I see people. Um, so a Zoom question uh, was part of the whole story here was about um, rising interest rates and how rising interest rates um, affected bank practices and the asset bubbles. Um, were there other policy options to fight inflation besides rising interest rates available? Um, they were wondering because they didn't hear people speak to that. I mean, the question is how to go after uh, inflation without raising interest rates. I mean, I'll, I'll, uh, the folks at the Federal Reserve are, are smarter than I am on this, but a big part of the inflation has been profits uh, going up. Uh, and there's windfall profits taxes, things like that, that could potentially be uh, added into the mix. Whether that would address the, the entirety of the issue, uh, I don't know, that's beyond me. If anyone else wanted to speak to that. Well, I know my my pet um, thought is that uh, low interest rates create all this crazy um, financial speculation and asset bubbles. So that, that's an issue. You know, people always talk about price inflation, uh, but they don't always talk about asset price inflation. That's, that's an issue as well. Um, but, you know, the inflation, it's not easy to figure out how to fight inflation. Um, and this one is not like the inflation of the 70s. Um, and you know, that and, and we were saying that the Fed being like the only remaining competent institution in society, um, they, they do what they the only thing they can do. Uh, it's impossible, and we could raise taxes, but it's impossible to imagine the U.S. government raising taxes. It's just, you know, I could walk on water before that's going to happen. Uh, so <laughs> I don't know, it's, it's bad. Yeah, I agree. I think raising interest rates, raising taxes, uh, cutting down some corporate power uh, that allows price gouging, all, all seem like things to do. And yeah, I, would, I don't know if we have anything else. Wait, you know, real interest rates, interest rates less inflation are still like zero or negative. Um, so, it's not like monetary policy is very tight, but it's we've been so spoiled by all these years of zero percent interest rates. It's like we can live with something approaching a normal level of interest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let's see over there. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's more of a general question. But when my interest rates aren't all that high, maybe when the Fed, I don't know. What is it? This is more general question. I think banks freaking out when which is for this aren't historically exceptionally high. It's like, it's not, I remember the 80s. It was, it was crazy then. It's not at that level. So this is more, maybe it's, maybe it's too, maybe it's too general a question. Why, why do free, why these freak outs, it seems, at this particular moment? Oh, I think the reason they can add to this is that like the change is abrupt and so, they have a bunch of assets on their balance sheets that are based on really low interest rates. And so when interest rates go up, the value of those assets goes way down. And so they face a crunch on their balance sheet and have to take losses. Um, so it, 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 yeah, you're right. It's not the absolute level that's the problem. It's the change. It's the rapid change. And I guess my second question, sorry, real quick. How do you think, and I think you made a point of this thing, why did they invest in 10 year government bonds at like some like ridiculously low percent? Because exactly they had no place else to go. I think it's typical to invest in long term safe, okay. safe securities as a safe asset. Like just it's actually just like the safe part of the bank's balance sheet. Um and it, yeah. I see. And the supervisors, the regulators, really didn't pay too much attention to interest rate risk. They paid attention mm -hmm. to traditional things like credit risk. People look at it like their loans, but they didn't really pay attention to interest rate risk. Mm -hmm. uh, and when they did stress tests with big banks, they didn't do interest rate risk. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's right. There are things you could do to mitigate some of the risk. You could get involved in interest rate swaps, you kind of like insurance policies against this, but then things get even more complicated and interconnected. Country or the involvement of swap is not the last financial place. It's not saying it's the same thing, uh, but it just makes things more complicated. Well, I think the Silicon Valley Bank management thought about it and rejected it because it was going to be used as a currency, which is stupid. And they did. Mm -hmm. Well, I, all these financials are sophisticated. There aren't that much more sophisticated uh, than a regular person. I mean, they're, they're subject to the same meaning as the panics that everyone else is. Mm -hmm. uh, they may have a bigger, bigger financial vocabulary, but the, the, the underlying psychological structures are very similar. <laughs> Kate's taught us long ago, yeah, others. Um, uh, I actually use privilege, stack privilege for myself on stack briefly, and then um, there's there's still more, but people should feel free to keep coming in. Um, so my question was one, I just still am a little unclear why, I mean, maybe this goes to what you just said, Doug, but why they would um, basically risk being uninsured. Like, and more or less, why would you put more than $250,000 in a deposit? Like, what's the... Um, what's the incentive? What's the the possible return you're expecting? Um, is it just that you're so confident that government will bail you out, or does that not play a part in the psychology? Um, so that was my question. Another thing, just as a comment, was I think it's really good to focus on how much like these are problems created by the incredible maldistribution of income in our economy, and that like that's a sort of fundamental in terms of the like what can socialists do what can we focus on kind of question it is important to like tie those things together that the like speculative banking stuff is related to the kind of inequality stuff we love to talk about all the time and making those connections is important the last thing which i don't know if this is for you guys or really for anyone in the room but i'm kind of curious about like how politicizable we think some of these things are so it's like you know kristen Gillibrand. it was like definitely a big supporter of crypto like deregulation like and you know i i kind of think she should be primary for like a lot of reasons i'm wondering if we think like how successful knocking on doors and saying like Bill Brad loves crypto like do we like what do we think about that politically eric adams also is this part of our anti-adams spiel or is this stuff too arcane to like you know outside of ordinary experience that it's not something we can really do that about, but it's something we can just observe and think about like where the ruling class is, who are the elements in it, et cetera. That's again, that's not like, that could be a question for anyone in this room actually, I'm kind of curious. Um, so maybe give it to you guys and then I'll let David do a direct response and then we'll go back to the staff. So uh, maybe just to take a look at three parts, why do people put more than 250,000 in this? Uh, some of it's I'm sure part of, uh, you know, uh, either ignorance or overconfidence in uh, the bank uh, staying on its two feet. Uh, another thing, uh, there have been some questions, and I think Liz Warren uh, sent out a questionnaire to all the Silicon Valley banks to ask, well, it's, it's funny that you've got all these inter interconnected relationships you're loaning out uh, uh, through this bank. Were there any arrangements that if you're doing this, then you have to keep your deposits in the bank also? I don't know what the answers to those questions are going to be, but I think it's a, a fair question to ask. Mm -hmm. uh, there might have been agreements to keep people's uh, funds in those banks. Mm -hmm. uh, also, people just have more money than they know what to do with. Uh, there's uh, also, there are uh, programs out there where you can pay someone to move your money around so you don't get that $250,000 limit, but that costs money. And that's an extra cost to uh, to figure out that if you want to keep going, you know, cash or something liquid, which is another consideration for it. Um, I, I, I got lost in some of the other questions, so I don't know if anyone wants to bail me out some speak. We're remembering like something like 46% of the deposits in the system. I'm not sure. So it's like a lot of them. Yeah. It's crazy. It is. Um, is it, haven't people heard of treasury bills? or I don't really understand why they did it. But they, you know, there's an awful lot of complacency. Yeah. All these sophisticated people are too sophisticated. So. I think that there's like a sense not that, that it's like even safer than the treasury bond. I, I don't know. Yeah. It's like somewhat like money under your mattress. Um, it's just lazy. Or lazy, yeah. yeah. Honestly, I have lazy yeah. and I'm and I think that's a big part of it. Well, if you might only keep a lot of money in again, but 
payroll to cover, or you know, just got a loan yeah. that gets right. credited to your account. Right. Where do you put it? So it's, it's, yeah. it's there's that. But, yeah. um, there's also a great deal of complacency. Yeah. On the politicizing like it question, I honestly have no idea. I'm curious what the crowd thinks. Uh, my sense is that people like love technology. I kind of love it. <laughs> like, like, like love Instagram and stuff, and so like our just you know, like, would not want to rally around it. But I'm curious. Yeah. Yeah, maybe you wanted to direct. Are you direct, yeah. direct responding? Or yeah, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll give two quick responses. So one. I guess so. Yeah, I work at like a tech. I work at a tech company. I'm on our business strategy team, which basically whatever, whatever that means. Um, <laughs> one thing I will say is that like in terms of like zero interest rate policy, one of the things I've been annoyed at work lately is that like there's part of it is we don't make money. I haven't made money for over five years, and then I sit in meetings where I'm like, how do we like just reduce this part of our business, improve the margins on this? Let's do that. Then people are like, but growth, the numbers, they're going to look lower when we talk to investors, and I'm just like. But we've never made money in the last five years. No one in this room. Yeah, has the venture capitalist funding you or something? Oh, we were in our last round of funding came from the Rain Group and Timasak Holding, which is a Singaporean software wealth fund. Uh -huh. Um, so I'm just sort of like, guys, if we don't make money, why are we going to continue to not make money in these markets? Can we not just exit them or like do that? I'm like, no, the number's gonna go down. And it's like I just can't do it. It just makes me go insane. Um, so the globalization, the follow up little way that question. I think probably people don't like crypto, I think, but I think the thing is, it's low salience. Like I think about my, I was thinking about this, my mom used to work in banking. And when I asked her about some of these like recent news stories, she was just like, oh, I just wasn't paying attention to it. Because it didn't impact her directly, yes. And so I think until this stuff really starts impacting people and it really starts hitting them, I think it's just something that it's like, eh, it's just another thing that's happening. And I also think in some ways the Biden administration's immediate response and, and all the sort of government response to it just made people not think about it was really <laughs> honestly so it's like you don't need to worry about your money the government's got you and you're like okay well i'm just gonna go back to where you sort of keep things moving in that way and until it like impacts people much more directly i just don't know how like high salience this is of an issue at least right now back to brunch okay. uh yeah go ahead hey. oh yeah, yeah sorry for little yeah, uh, yeah, the just bought a lot of uh, bottle of back in the 2000, uh, I'm going to say back in the 2008 French drive crisis, which was a large number of bank sales, but still fast in the, in the mind of the homeless investigator of collapse, the collapse of banks. Uh, they can sacrifice impact as a market. One of the, uh, the primary ways to bank and various housing bought the school. The rules in the rip in the rules it it started in lay. Because I, I, I remember that back in 2000, 2008 when the mm -hmm. went through some bailouts and, and went through some bailouts was like 15 years ago when we went to do bail when they went bailouts. And then and then what I heard and, and I heard that during the pandemic, um when when Trump was uh, was there, Trump wanted to bail the governments out. The corporation. So the question is, the weather fake fellow can 2020 why can why it can't where it's done? Where we go for there? That's a big question. I don't um uh, yeah, not much to add. I think uh uh Doug, I have it for uh, a bit it's been decades since there's been uh, a crisis where uh, the, the folks at the top have really taken a hit, uh, and that's that's a big uh, it's it's a big issue. It's a big problem. Um, I saw gentleman glasses here in the front. You're not looking. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I, think almost, I think the question was more or less aligned yours um, about sort of how do we come up with a politics like a like particularly left politics, right? Um, because, like you mentioned, I mean, a lot of these um, subjects are not particularly salient. There's a lot of arcane language that I don't understand, um, sort of half understand. So, you know, how do we personalize this to in a way and use a language, I guess, by which it's understandable, it's graspable? And I do agree that this, or I think it might have been you or someone else who said that it has to be sort of, sort of direct impact. 
from the finance sector or crypto into people's uh, lives. And I feel like the left is very happy and coming, in, coming up with critical analysis, but not necessarily with responses. Yeah. <laughs> but um, that's just a comment. Maybe you guys you already commented. So um, the second question, though, I just maybe want to touch upon is maybe it's a broader philosophical question because I see that there's a difference between, sorry, what's your name? Mm -hmm. Emily and Doug in terms of the role of money. Um, and their approach to money and particularly easy or more money into the economy is good. Doug is, I don't know about that, but I guess like, I was just wondering like if you, do you see like money, is it important to, is it important that money be connected to actual productivity in the, in the real economy? Would that be something that you're closer to? I'm just that's No, I think like, you know, easy money in a crisis, perfect. I mean, that's what you, you need that to prevent it from getting out of hand, but it's just not good as a standard operating procedure. It's like having free money all of it. Um, but yeah, I think money is basically valorized by what you buy. Um, and the goods and services that you can buy, but what makes the US dollar valuable is not necessarily you know, what the US government says is valuable, it's just if you can buy all kinds of stuff with it. Uh, mm -hmm. and uh, money that is just produced without any connection to uh, uh, the real world is going to be um, fantasy inflated money. It's the, the, the asset inflation, the goods inflation, or both. Um, I just hit uh, near slide about the, the, the two, the contracting policy with St. Louis Fed and the uh, Atlanta. Mm -hmm. The St. Louis is really for this real real stock. Mm -hmm. money had to, or credit had to be associated with real economic activity. And, you know, I think as a normal procedure, that's probably not a bad idea, but in the midst of, you know, like 31, that was a very bad idea. Oh, and I was wondering about that map of the regions. Didn't that also just map out? <laughs> yeah, that's a very good critique. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know, I think it's kind of a good chart for like um, the thing that you know, to think about expectations changing with things. So, <laughs> but um, to, to go back to, yeah, I think actually Doug and I probably don't disagree as much as perhaps at the outset, it seems like we do. But um, I do think the thing that's very complicated in a capitalist economy and perhaps any economy is that like the value of money is not always completely tied to what it can buy and sell that's like what that's like the definition of inflation is like you don't it's like the what we think we can buy with the dollar is not what we can buy when we get to the store and like I, and i and like in the in cryptocurrency is like obviously a great example where it's like there's sort of nothing to this it's just a number on a screen Part of an algorithm, but it has value for a period of time for speculative reasons because some a bunch of people decided it had value, and thus, if I were to go and buy, you know, it cost me a lot of money to buy a, a Bitcoin today. Um, yeah, it's like yeah, it's like fifty thousand. Anyway, so um, I guess like a thing, and I think that that's. Both terribly scary and kind of a beautiful thing about the economy. Um, it's what allows monetary policy to work. Like if everything just translated dollar for dollar, like like into if prices adjusted immediately, we wouldn't like we wouldn't have any power to like ease things by print by basically printing money. But we do have power to ease recessions by printing money because there are price rigidities. But that but. And yeah, so prices don't adjust completely. If they did adjust completely automatically, then there would be no point of moving more money. So I guess the point is that it is a terrifying thing that we can have these asset bubbles and that things can be so far from fundamental value. But just from a standpoint of someone who's thought a lot about what fundamental value even means, it's not straightforward to define it. Um, and it's very hard to like pin it down. So I, I think that's an interesting conversation to continue having as a group. It's like what, like I would be totally in favor of like, of like more policies to restrict speculative activity, even though I said that shorting is important earlier. But anyway, I would, <laughs> I would, I would, I would be for it's like 
clamping down on speculative activity, I just think it's like it becomes kind of scary and difficult to pin down. No, when you think about money at all, it's really weird shit. That's why I never That's how capital volume one begins. Yeah, it's weird. And just uh, piggyback off of that, uh, there's an uh, activity with CNBC or one that wrote uh, the COVID pandemic. There's been a real coupling between uh, financial asset values and the real economy. It is real, as Doug said, uh, weird shit. It's phantom stuff. It's hard to make it look like concrete for people unless like paradigms comes out with like some cryptocurrency robo -cans. It's not it looks something that is like tangible that you can organize around. But I, I do think. People can understand the destabilizing effects of uh, odd speculative stuff, and to maybe make it uh, uh, to touch on, and to maybe make some names in Congress. Richie Torres who wrote a, an article uh, about a year ago: the liberal case for cryptocurrency is going to help our economy. Uh, in particular, in New York, it's like really silly stuff. But I think that there are some folks who might have a little bit of egg on their face. But, uh, it's stuff that they've been saying for, for a while. I mean, with this stuff still trading at super high volume uh, values. Uh, maybe uh, we can go see what happens when the music starts. Well, what's going on in New York and where they're going to use all that upstate electrical generating capacity to mine Bitcoin, which is just, you know, criminal, environmentally criminal. Yeah, it is. I mean, at what point? If you're shoveling money into the economy, you know, is getting more liquidity. At what point does it begin to um, eat away at the value of, of that, you know, that money? Uh, and uh, kind of in a related question, the fact that uh, there are economies now in the world that are uh, moving away from the dollar. Um, what kind of uh, impact is that going to have? Uh, the BRICS are, are beginning to move into their own currencies and away from the dollar. Um, okay, I guess like inflation is, I would say, a pretty direct outcome of shoveling a lot of money into the economy. That's what would have, like, you know, again, there's no price rigidities. You shovel money into the economy, prices would suggest, and Tons of inflation happens, and there's no point. It's just on that one. So, yeah, inflation is one outcome, and I think these inflated asset prices are another outcome. Although I feel like I'm been trying, and Jeremy sort of helped me more concretely say it, summarize my point that I, I personally feel that redistributive policy can really help with the inflated asset price issue. I think, like, right now we just have a ruling class that gets to play with money and, like, Asset prices just sort of spiral up, and venture capitalists sort of are googling. But um, uh, so yeah, so I think that both of those are direct outcomes of the money machine yeah. coming to our, um, <laughs> And then to what? Well, yeah, yeah. No, like inflation really has a psychological effect on society too. Like the sense that everything is like. Yeah, all values are distorted, like things are out of control, and it often leads to a, you know, wanting some kind of authoritarian crackdown. Yeah. Um, and it's it's dangerous game to play. And then I think, wait, your second question. Oh, the dollar. Oh my gosh. Yeah, <laughs> I feel that like, yeah, we've been enjoying a luxury for a long time in this country, which is that the U.S. dollar is massively powerful globally, um, as the like say. So currency of choice. Um, if that ends, yeah, well, well it's uh, it's. I'll tell you one thing: it's going to be a lot harder to implement fiscal policy with no consequences. Um, so, like things like the fiscal policy that happened during the pandemic will be a lot harder and more expensive for the country, and either require much higher taxes or just won't be feasible. So it's funny, I actually was going to ask directly on that, just because it's a kind of a term of art, can you guys just say what fiscal policy is and what yes. we mean by it, just to make sure everyone in the room? What I mean by it is when either the federal government or the state government does direct spending, um, either in the form of checks or debit cards or whatever that you know, some of us received during the pandemic, or in the form of 
uh, investing in the economy, the infrastructure, or, you know, whatever, the direct spending by the government, well, by tax, the state, taxation. state, and 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 taxation. Sending hundred billion dollars to Ukraine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's going to help the Ukraine. Not quite clear. All that. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, the last question kind of anticipated part of what you said. So I'll try to see if I can pivot a little bit. Uh, but I did want to bring in the international uh, aspect to it. So the question of denialization and, and the fact that the US has been, you know, basically on a free ride for a half century with uh, other countries using a surplus to fund the US debt. And, you know, in the medium to long term, I guess the, the question I'm going to try to bring up is in the medium to, you know, longer term, what is that going to do when we no longer have that free ride? So I think that was partly addressed already. Uh, if the dollars no longer the main reserve currency, but uh, thinking in, in terms of both strategy and what the implications of that would be. So, and I get in the short term more regularization, uh, becoming you know more like boring Canadians or uh, <laughs> what 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 have you, uh, or you know thinking mid term or, or long term about public banking, etc. But what, what are going to be the limitations uh, when we can't count on? Pure quantitative easing or printing money to you know just continue to fund things. I mean, we're I think we're kind of stuck in that mentality a little bit, maybe. And that when that's you know probably going to end, you know, mid to long term at least, it's not it's not sooner. I mean, we can kind of all these banking failures seem to be indicating some sort of crisis. I mean, I think everyone that I talked to thinks that this will be another you know major crisis. And so, what do you do to then to anticipate the next crisis and try to strategize in the short term, but also thinking you know what to do long term. That's my big broad question. That's that's rich. <laughs> that's my personal. Yeah, it was a great scene in uh, Robert Benmore and uh, uh, all the King's Men, where this the, the Huey Long figure had not yet become the Huey Long figure, and he's just giving his long and boring speech about tax dollars. And his advisor says, "Just drop all that stuff and tell me you're going to soak the fat boys." <laughs> 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 Yeah. But just to follow up, I mean, isn't the fact that we have such low like taxation because we can just fund our debt with bondholders, you know, buying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're just pissing it all away. We've run these gigantic deficits for so long now for no that have nothing to show for it. No, it's not like we're investing in infrastructure or raising the level of the standard of living of a forest or anything. It's just like we have nothing. Well, what was the end of your question? Well, it's like, is it isn't the fact that we have such low taxation because we can just fund everything through debt? Oh, yeah. And so, you know, it seems like if we're just going to, but you know, taxing sounds great, but I mean, we just have this free ride. So that's why there's no political will to. to I mean, if you look at the social democracies, the direct social democracies, they have very high tax rates. And it's not just the rich, they tax the middle class people pretty heavily. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, they spend it on benefits and they get it back. But yeah, it's uh, you're just not doing it. So I guess don't tax anybody. Yeah, I mean, but I, I do think it's a question, like just realistically, if does our country have the political will to implement something like that? I don't know. Probably not. Like things would have to get pretty bad, probably. Um, for actually, yeah, I guess like my like one of the, things that are pretty bad for a lot of people. So I think it would have to get pretty bad for the top. Earners um, before I would expect there to be a change in tax, a broad change in tax policy in the US. I think more likely, like, you know, I don't know, we all like, already have like defining uh, lifespans in the last, you know, like I think things are, things are going. Slowly down down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, and the movement we're building and plays a part. I mean, I, you know, not to be like the booster. <laughs> like, I, yeah, I was going to say, I think that one thing to, to think about is like the kind of if we build it, they will come mentality of like, I think starting institutions like the public, I don't know if there's any feasibility of this thing has, but I just having ideas and policies lined up that, you know, can slot in when the time comes is really. Great idea. Mm -hmm. 
Um, thank you. Um, thank you all for the great, excellent panel. Um, in terms of um, political salience, I think cryptocurrency isn't like a good one for like knocking on doors. Personal rivals are like or likes crypto. Um, but I think, <laughs> I think we could tie it to housing. You know, I, I know it's very interesting what was coming out about, um, you know, uh, Doug, you were saying about housing being an asset or, um, and then we all were talking about um, the, that's the lowest level of loans since we started keeping track, which was like since when? 73. 73. Um, and, and just connecting some dots for people in terms of how um, this is, you know, the, the lax oversight of banking leads to, you know, people not being able to afford to live in New York City. You know, I just think it's connecting dots to um, campaigns that we currently have. And I like what you were just saying, Emily, about, um, you know, supporting starting structures that could make sense to replace the six structures we have, the unwell structures we have. Um, and then and I think encouraging people to sign up to those and get public support for, um, uh, I think, does Jabari have something forward? Uh, James, uh, like sort of public banking. Uh, Senator James Sanders is the uh, sponsor of that. He's the chair of the bank. Is that something that DSA could support? Uh, I think they're already part of the coalition, the uh, public bank and licensing coalition. Did you public mention that coalition. today? Uh, I don't think I, I was kind of rushing over it. Maybe a, maybe a word of that would be interesting yeah. because that was an example of what you had just offered as a um, possible route. Um, um, James, I, I'd be interested to hear. I know we have a question about our. Sure, yeah. And as far as I uh, to kind of take those in order, connecting it to current campaigns, there's yeah. a, a big problem with housing prices being very, very high. And as uh, Doug was talking about earlier, we haven't seen inflation. And if that's been, you know, things in red kind of inflation uh, over the years, uh, this now, but uh, asset price inflation in the real estate sector. Uh, and that's connected to, I mean, there's a big battle in the year's budget this year. Governor Pope with the housing compact. And I think a lot of folks have taken uh, supply and demand, libertarian angle of things, without really considering the uh, interconnection of finance cap. But I mean, it's also tough to knock on someone's door and say, did you know that finance capital is really yada yada? Uh, it's, it's a tough thing to, uh, <laughs> to talk about in an uh, uh, in elevator pitch. Uh, and as far as uh, public banking goes, um, I think there's going to be, uh, at the New York City level, there's going to be a hearing on Wednesday uh, on making a kind of, uh, uh, something for the devil's in the details, but uh, New York City coming up with kind of a, a plan for what it would do if the bill passes. I think there's a rally also, uh, but uh, I'll try to get the details of those uh, after this. Um, two last questions. Is that okay? And then we'll break. Um, so, gentlemen, the boss is there. Hi, uh, my name is Eric. I am a, a retiree from the New York City Transit Authority. I was a track worker and a track inspector uh, and an open communist, re elected and re elected as shop steward by my co workers for uh, almost 30 years. I think that, uh, well, I, I also have been around a while. I also remember um, the Continental Illinois Bank break, uh, fiasco. And I remember that with very little hesitation, the federal government nationalized Continental Illinois Bank. Of course, they unloaded it the first chance they got, what they expropriated. But to me, it makes perfect sense to say what we have to do in the case of bank failures, what socialists should be saying is, they are for the expropriation of the banks, that is nationalization without compensation, and they're being placed under workers' control. Uh, and I, it's every bit as utopian, I don't think it's utopian, but it's every bit as utopian as the Green New Deal, which I'm also for, which I think points the way toward economic planning, which is what we need to save the world, actually. Uh, and these, these may not be things that we can put into effect or win a lot of people over to or talk to a lot of people about it now. I think it's more than a lot of people think. However, it's what we need. 
It's what we need. Otherwise, you're saying, uh, well, we're being we're being about to be trampled by uh, some kind of wild animal going to trample us underfoot. So we, as we have no weapons to hold them off, we should use spitballs. Now, that just makes man more angry. If you can't do it, you can talk about it. And I think that what Eugene Debs said uh, is, which people probably know, he said, uh, it's better to demand what you want than not get it, than to demand what you don't want than get it. And I think that's what we should be going on. Uh, I got a lot more to say, but uh, okay. we're going to end here. Thanks, sir. I would like to hear some kind of comment. Uh, we do have, as far as a tool beyond spitballs, Section 606 of the Banking Act, which was exercised this time in kind of a way that didn't do what uh, I think uh, you and I might look for. It, it allows for the takeover of a bank if it's if it breaks the law, if it's unsafe, unsound. Uh, the issue with that right now, I mean, it's a it's a big tool. It's, it's a big tool. Tip, yeah. Uh, so for state regulated banks, uh, uh, specifically Signature Bank was, uh, you can take them over if they break the law. You can maybe uh, exercise, if if you wanted to, you could say if you're exploiting people in Malaysia with whatever weird banking relationships, uh, we've got a law against that, you know, uh, uh, you are now a state bank. Uh, that, that's a tool that's available. Uh, I don't think right now the governor and the financial regulator Want to own and operate a bank, and I think that that's that's the main rub that's right there right now. But I think it's more concrete, and uh, I mean, it, it's not something that people think about within uh, uh, what's possible or feasible. But uh, there there's some structure out there already. I remember back in the seventies and loan crisis in the late eighties, early nineties. I was thinking. If we're going to bail these guys out, we should like turn them into some kind of public institutions of various sorts. Uh, and so, you know, turning over to the private sector once they're bailed out the tune of 300 billion or whatever it was. And nobody actually has an account of how, how much the savings loan bailout cost. And a research assistant did it and crawled all over trying to find out if it's an estimate that nobody had to win. So if we just spent all the money, had no idea. But, um, uh, this seems so politically difficult, but you know, I like Jody Dean's idea of a communist horizon, which is something that organizes our thoughts about where we'd like to go, and even if it's very remote and seems pretty seen as we approach it. Now, it's, it's nice to have that communist horizon. So, I think the kinds of things you're talking about are very mm -hmm. much part of that communist horizon. That's the world I would like to see. Uh, and you know, it's really hard to figure out how to get rid of them. It's really hard to get to the horizon. Last question. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I was going to make two policy comments. One on the sort of tax and you know, rely on low tax rates and just use deficit spending. Um, I think that still, if you were going to have like a meaningful expansion of the welfare state, you would need significant tax revenues. And to Doug's point, those don't all have to be super progressive tax sources. Um, and that just goes to the amount of revenue you need to fund expansive uh, welfare state policy. Um, on the bank regulation point, I wonder, if the public bank is interesting, but it seems like at this point you could say, well, um, we know they're gonna get bailed out, so we really just have to treat them as utilities and for existing banks impose just a stricter regulatory framework. And I'm not actually sure what it's kind of interesting about know, what we would want it to do because it seems like the like we want them to not go under, right? We want them to not take risks that expose depositors, maybe more than trying to correct for other forms of malfeasance. Like if you had a really well-regulated private banking sector, I don't know what the additional benefit of a public bank would be, unless you, I don't know, had other concerns about who they're lending to or capital allocation, but that seems like it, it, it gets, it's hard to do that as a real policy outcome, but it's easier and easier to make the argument as it becomes clear that there is no real market discipline uh, in in cases like an SVB fraud. 
Yeah, um, uh, I'm not exactly sure what a well regulated banking sector would look like without how much it would be different from what we've got right now. I think we kind of see how these things operate in practice. Um, and it, uh, it always ends up looking kind of bad. As far as what would a public bank do, that's that's a big open question. Uh, and that could also potentially go very badly or could slot back into what we've uh, got right now. Uh, I think in uh, um, March wrote that uh, controlled credit system is the province both profits and charlatans or something like that. It could go kind of any number of different ways. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a great thing. Yeah. Um, nicely makes yeah. character of profit and this is the Bank of China. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, and uh, there, there are uh, examples we can look at to see exactly how they're uh, operating in practice. But I think it also kind of gets back there's that like, billing revenue code uh, that it would be investing less in uh, high profit uh, activities. And uh, I mean, what we would be investing in is, uh, again, a big open question, I would presume. Uh, to know how to map out all of that, uh, some of those unanswered questions. Now, Biden's original Build Back Better had a care component to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've got you know, Congress tell that because Congress is a basic institution. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's, I don't think Dylan Riley knew that. That was originally. <laughs> um, we did, sorry, I missed one last question from the very back. Go. Oh, thanks. Great uh, discussion. Uh, so, uh, I guess it's like trying to think about what we can do and like, you know, capitalism has, you know, like, you know, it provides a rope to hang itself with. Like, I'm just kind of wondering, like, what can like civic or leftist financial activism look like? I remember like during the financial crisis, my cousin, husband was like, he essentially was like shaking on mix and like buying people's debt at like a much lower cost. Uh, and, you know, like say what you will about Wall Street bets, but they did, you know, act with a lot of like hedge fund people uh, and were able to like, you know, hit back capitals where it hurts. And I'm just wondering, like, are we not being, is, have left has not been imaginative enough and have, have there been examples of ways to do like kind of some kind of civic or leftist financial activism that would actually help people like debt collectors, I don't know, things like that. Uh, like digitally, I suppose it would be possible if you know, values are very depressed in a crisis moment uh, to do something like that. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, as all of these assets are getting sold off, there's a question of who's buying them and what are they going to do with them. Uh, and right now, uh, I mean, the winners and losers are kind of who you would expect it to be. So, for instance, Silicon Valley Bank had some obligations, some legal obligations that it had to do low-income investments in its you know, local neighborhoods, and that just wiped off like thing right now. So, I mean, that's kind of the opposite of what you're asking about. Uh, uh, so, I don't mean to end on you, you know. <laughs> but, uh, but if George Soros were the communist, the right said he is, he could really help us out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that, yeah, I guess maybe like I don't have an answer for that today, but it sounds like a bunch of people in the room are all thinking about that sort of spiraling around this question about like both practically what can we do sort of on the ground and sort of in the policy sphere. So I think just we can keep noodling. It's yeah, the work. We're working on it. <laughs> uh, so let's thank our speakers. Uh, a couple of just quick announcements. Um, first of all, just in terms of like, uh, just this TSA space in terms of keeping it um, clean and everything. Let's make sure to stack our chairs on the walls at the end. We also, um, this is a political education event. This space, thankfully, NYC DSA pays rent for um, out of our membership dues, which you should raise yours if you have it, um, or pay them uh, local dues. But also um, for political education activities, we pass the hat just if you can afford to put something in. This allows us to do ambitious school events in places. Yes, the bicycle helmet. Um, coming up um, on Next week, Sunday, we have another special political education event um, on the protests in France um, with a couple of visiting French um, MPs, as well as uh, a writer on uh, French politics. So that's going to be here um, at, I believe, 6 p.m. next Sunday. 
um, uh, March, uh, then April the 23rd, so back in March. Um, second of all, um, our next, uh, for Polyette, our next night school is two days after that on uh, Tuesday the 25th. And the subject of that is the uh, New Deal and the Popular Front. I believe um, Ben Davis, who spoke a little earlier, is going to be um, one of the coordinators of that. So come out for that. And uh, finally, um, NYCDSA is in the middle of a huge campaign to tax the rich and to fight back against the horrible New York State governor. Um, the budget is still like coming, but there's still time to act. So please just go to taxtherichny.com. Um, send a letter, call the leadership, tell them F you to <laughs> bail and uh, bail will backs and charters and yes to uh, tenant protections and taxing the rich and uh, climate legislation, BPRA. Um, there's still actions to take. I think there's also maybe, oh, and finally, right around the corner on Tuesday, oh, good announcement. Um, right around the corner on Tuesday at the Trader Joe's on Grand and Essex, there's going to be a big rally from 11 to 3. Um, Trader Joe's is unionizing. They're having their union vote on Wednesday. Um, so they want a huge showing on Tuesday. Um, it's a great confidence and power. It would be um, a really big step in organizing a major national retailer. And DSA has been supportive um, on the ground floor of this campaign. So if at all, you know, during your lunch hour, if you're at work, please, please, please come in front of the Trader Joe's shop right over here um, on uh, Essex and Grand and rally with the workers. Thanks, everybody. Um, thank you for all the thoughtful comments. Have a great night. <laughs> Thank you.